morning, everyone. I'm calling the meeting of the Del Mar College Board of Regents to order at 10.31 a.m. I uh, want to welcome you. In the, um, in the real world, the calendar world, we say Happy New Year in January, but in the academic world, we say Happy New Year at our first meeting in September because school has started and we are, are at the start of another uh, academic year, so Happy New Year to everyone. And we are meeting for the first time um, in our new regular meeting location at the uh, Del Mar College Center for Economic Development. Uh, so welcome everyone and thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm gonna call roll, Dr. Villarreal? Here. Uh, Ms. Avert? Here. Ms. Hutchison? Here. <laughs> Mr. Garza? Here. Mr. Bennett? Here. And I'm Carol Scott. We have a quorum and can conduct business. Uh, Regent Kelly and Regent Turner could not be with us today and Dr. Adami will be just a few minutes late but he will be joining us uh, very shortly. Would you all please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. Regent Garza, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And would you please join me in reading the Del Mar College vision statement. Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Thank you. Uh, Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meeting in uh, real time with the exception of the portions of the meeting that may be considered closed, statute, closed session by statute. I'm going to have to, we're all going to have to get used. There's a different sound, a different little bit of an echo uh, from this room, so we're gonna go, all going to have to get, get used to it. Uh, we do have an opportunity at this time for any public comments. Uh, is there anyone here from the public? I don't see anyone that registered today. Is that correct? So we do not have any public comments this morning. Correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, our item of business for this workshop session is related to our strategic plan. Uh, and as, um, as we have talked about previously, we have a series of these workshops uh, throughout the year in, in addition to other topics, but we make a point of three or four sessions a year specifically related to our strategic plan and the uh, key performance indicators. As opposed to doing it all in one long session, we break it up over chunks of time. And it also helps because then, as information is most fresh for that set of key performance indicators, uh, then we can, can have uh, up-to-date information. So with that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Escamilla mm -hmm. to make any, any, any introductory remarks as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. And uh, for everybody's information, there's a little, I just got a little housekeeping message before we kick off. Much of what you see here is temporary. Uh, these screens, uh, these actual microphones, um, the configuration still of the size of this dais is gonna be stretched out for more um, uh, spacing appropriate for our time. Um, and uh, a few other items, um, wires out of the wall. We're, this, is a, this is a work in progress. This room is a work in progress. Uh, our supply lines are, are, are delayed, as, as they are across the world. We're feeling those effects as we move ahead. Stay tuned. More change will be coming. Uh, I, but before we do, I, I have to thank our staff and our team that was working through the weekend um, to get us where we are. And just as they were about to finish everything, I had to put the brakes on it because of the storm and send everybody home to be, make sure everybody was safe and taking care of their own. And then I called them back in the middle of the afternoon yesterday as they were probably getting comfortable and, and, and settling in. Um, but I wanna thank them for their patience, uh, their their, their, certainly their expertise, but their professionalism in coming back and just getting the job done to get us set up for today. And to the regents, thank you all for dealing and putting up with, our, with the yes go, stop, stop go kind of situation with us. Um, it's important that uh, we, we, we we execute these meetings in a, as a timely manner possible and um, 
to have delayed it would have been very, very uh, disruptive to a lot of things. But uh, anyway, that being said, so we have, as, as Madam Chair was saying, one more year, another trip around the sun uh, and from the academic sense. And it's a, uh, it's a great start to the fall semester. Um, every start is great, and sometimes they bring great challenges. And certainly this semester is bringing challenges that we did not expect. But we always expect the unexpected, so in that regard, we're ready. Uh, that being said, uh, Dr. Wilson, if you can step up and kind of come up, I just want to say that now is the time to uh, review our plan. And before we do kick off and look at the, 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 the next year's iterations and of, uh, of our existing strategic plan, I want to remind everybody that what we see is uh, simply in, in PowerPoint and can be changed. And that's the, that's the idea. Updated, changed, improved, and the like. Um, is, is what we have as an opportunity in front of us. And I'll just finish by saying, before I hand the mic over, that the state, too, is changing their strategic plan. And they're doing it because they're listening to us, and they're listening to themselves, and they realize the strengths and or the weaknesses of their plan. We have strengths and weaknesses with our plan, because that's what a, that's what a plan is about. So um, as we move ahead, just know that uh, uh, we'll be listening for those challenges and those strengths of those, of those opportunities to change. We already have some in mind, and we'll be bringing those back. But, uh, but thank you all, uh, again, for everybody's patience as we kick off um, another year here at Del Mar College, another ac wonderful academic year, despite all the challenges. Dr. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Ramirez Wilson. I'll be leading you today in a workshop on our strategic plan KPIs. These KPIs were established as part of the development of our strategic plan just a few years ago. They help us to measure our progress towards meeting our goals for both student success and college-wide improvements over the course of five years. Our plan, entitled Aspire, Engage, Achieve, excuse was me, officially... Excuse me one second. Uh, Regents, these screens are not going to be helpful. Your, 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 your best bet is to maybe kick back. I'll bring popcorn a little bit later. Your bigger screens out there, uh, these, the, these bigger screens will probably be uh, more helpful to you all. You, these you are cut off. We will remove these after today. We, we realize these just do not work. But your better positions are the bigger screens. Sorry about that. Christine. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I would hate for them to be looking like, where should I look? What do I do? <laughs> Our plan, entitled Aspire, Engage, Achieve, was officially adopted in September of 2019 and includes six overarching goals. Each goal has established KPIs and objectives. The college has also developed an operational plan, which includes KPI thresholds, targets, and institutional strategies put into place to support the attainment of the plan's goals and objectives. As Dr. Escamilla mentioned, we seek for our operational plan to be a living document because things change. With this workshop, we are beginning our second year of review of these KPIs. Today, we will be reviewing the KPIs of goal one of the strategic plan. Each goal has a set of KPIs, and for each KPI, we'll be discussing the most recent data and comparing this to our thresholds and targets. We will also be looking at trends and how the college has performed over time. And finally, for each of these goals, or the one goal we are discussing today, we will discuss the college's strategies to meet our targets and our thresholds. My colleagues, Dr. John DeHalcom and Cheryl Sanders will also be joining me to present um, information on this goal. We will start a review of each KPI with a look at our most recent data, what you can call our data snapshot. Each KPI has an identified threshold and target. Thresholds are the college's acceptable levels of achievement, which you may call our minimum target. Thresholds that are not met indicate that additional activities and or resources are needed to address the, this aspect of student success. Targets are the college's aspirational objectives for improvement, which you may call our stretch goals. The Strategic Planning Committee set these thresholds and targets by reviewing data trends over the course of a five-year period two years ago. 
When reviewing the data snapshots, you will see that the thresholds and targets are color-coded. Green, meaning that the threshold or target was met, and red, meaning that the threshold or target was not met. It's a good practice to celebrate our wins, but it's an even better practice to identify the areas in which we need to get stronger. The purpose of monitoring our KPIs is improvement. No matter how strong of a college that we are, and no matter our amount of wins, we always have to seek to improve and make sure that we are meeting the ever-evolving needs of our students and our community. Today we will discuss where we are now, what our most current data show, and whether we are meeting our thresholds. We will also discuss how we will compare both to ourselves and our community college peers. And we'll also discuss where we want to be, our targets, the direction that we wish to go. Through our data, we, help, we hope to tell the Del Mar College story. And data is only valuable if you understand the context in which it occurs. I believe that today's workshops will go a long way in helping us to understand Del Mar College's story. In addition, I know that quite a few of our regents will be attending the upcoming Board of Trustees Institute. And I think that the timing of this workshop is excellent. This institute will focus quite a bit on data, how we are doing in comparison to the state, and also equity, which is a big part of the Texas Success Center work. So I hope that this workshop will help prepare you for even more conversations as part of this institute. For each KPI, we'll compare ourselves to our large colleges peer group. It's important that we understand who makes up this peer group. The Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board groups colleges based on their enrollments. The fall 2019 enrollment for our peer group ranged from 8,000 students at Navarro College to 19,000 students at Blinn College. It's important to recognize that when comparing ourselves, that though comparing ourselves to our peers is valuable, there are many differences between our colleges that are unaccounted for in enrollment-based groupings. Differences of regional needs, economic circumstances, and cultural factors means that in many cases, we are not comparing apples to apples. There is no college out there that is just like Del Mar College. However, knowing where we stand in comparison to our peers can help provide us with some really good context. To get us started with goal one, um, my colleague, Dr. John DeHalcom, will provide an introduction about this goal. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board of Regents. Before we take a deep dive into our KPIs within our strategic plan, we want to take a moment to reflect on the years of work leading to this presentation. The Delmar College team has been using these data points for the last few years is a map to create intentional strategies to address these opportunities. Starting several years ago, we began preparing for guided pathways with the intent of refining and easing a student's academic journey by clarifying the courses needed to graduate with the least amount of hours and the least amount of debt. The end goal was to decrease the, decrease the hours and years to completion for our students. Del Mar College has been very fortunate in receiving a Title V HSI Senda grant, and we are in year three of this five-year grant, so we're making great progress. The strategies for the grant were to provide uniform advising, training for faculty and staff, four additional embedded advisors, and a career assessment tool. The objective for the Senda grant is to increase persistence and transfer rate for our students. Our recently submitted QEP also supports student success and completion by clarifying career goals, offering effective advising practices, improving student engagement, strengthening transfer pathways, and utilizing innovative technology. As you can tell, this work has been aligned and built greatly upon um, our other initiatives to properly leverage our assets and maximize our resources to meet the student success objectives. And I want to thank you. I will now turn this back to Dr. Wilson to take us through goal one KPI. 
All right. This goal is titled Completion, but it's important to keep in mind that it's really focused on helping our students complete their goals. So completion can take many forms. Goal one has seven KPIs. Bless you. KPIs three and four are closely related and will be presented together. Each KPI tells a key piece of our story and we will be looking at each one from several angles. KPI 1 is the number of degrees and certificates awarded by credit programs each year. The targets for this KPI are aligned with the state's 60 by 30 TX strategic plan. Within the plan, the state focuses on the number of degrees and certificates earned by African American, Hispanic, and economically disadvantaged students in order to ensure equity among student groups. The college is purposefully tracking the success of these students, of these student groups in support of the state's plan. You will see that our thresholds and targets are color coded. In 2020, we didn't meet our thresholds or targets for most aspects of this KPI. We attribute the decline in certificate and degree attainment to the impact of the national pandemic. We know that the pandemic impacted our students in many ways. And this past spring, we administered a survey to students enrolled in early 2020, but were not enrolled in the fall or in the subsequent spring. Many of the students cited personal finances, job responsibilities, and safety concerns as reasons for not re-enrolling. At this point, I'll stop for any questions. Here is a visual representation of our five-year trends. Over the past five years, we've seen a 14.3% increase in the number of degrees and certificates awarded. This rate of increase is higher than that of our large college peers at 14.1% and higher than the rate of increase for all Texas colleges at 9.4%. Visually, you'll see the target that we have set for ourselves as indicated by the blue star and our threshold line is indicated by the dotted line. As you can see, the threshold and target that we have set for ourselves is ambitious and is aligned with our 2018 attainment numbers, which are the highest that the college had ever seen at the time. One additional thing to keep in mind about this KPI is that it looks at the duplicated number of degrees and certificates awarded meaning that these numbers include students who earned multiple degrees. If you look just at the numbers of students who earn certificates or degrees annually, we have remained steady over the past five years at around 1,500 students a year. Excuse me, can, are the Texas large colleges and all Texas college numbers in that slide the same? Are they duplicate or unduplicated? They are duplicated. Okay. Yes. yes. What you see on the screen now is information that comes from the state, and the state tracks the number of degrees and certificates, not necessarily by student. But in looking at our own data, we can see that the number of students earning degrees and certificates has been consistent. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how did reverse transfers impact this on an annual basis? That's a very good question. And I know that we're seeking to improve our reverse transfer processes. At this time, I don't think they're as robust as we'd like them to be. But I think Dr. Escamilla may want to respond. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a smaller number. I, I'm, I, I don't have that number either. We're making note as, as to, to follow up on that. I have a related question, and, I, and I'm looking for it, not a question, but a scenario that I would like to talk about. Um, but I'm, I don't know if I should wait till goal. KPI 6 or not, but I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. At any given year, when we have this number of completers that we're talking about, we still have, in addition to that, about 1,500 to 1,800 leavers that go off to great universities all throughout. So the number is really closer to 3,000 students on, on an annual basis that go out. It's in the statistical profile. We've talked about this one before a couple, di several different times. 
But there's a whole group of students that are gathering less than an associate degree and going as fast as they can. I'm related to one of those, I, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, but that's a very common practice. So in the statistical profile, levers is something else that we probably need to incorporate to give the full picture of the transfer function here at the college, which is much greater than we're presenting. Now also in this, there's a lot of terminal degrees uh, where they're not uh, transferring out and the like in, in the numbers. So again, um, mixing different colored apples, but we cannot um, leave those out. Any other questions? Thank you. Here's a visual representation of our five-year trends with the data disaggregated by gender. During the last five years, females tended to earn more degrees and certificates than males, with the exception of the most recent year, 2020. In 2020, males earned 20 more degrees and certificates than females. Here's a visual representation of our five-year trends with the data disaggregated by ethnicity. During the last five-year period, the number of degrees and certificates awarded to Hispanic students has increased by 21%. The number awarded to white students has increased by 2.4%, and the number awarded to African-American students by almost 30%. Additional ethnic groups are not included on this chart due to their smaller numbers. Here's a visual representation of our five-year trends for economically disadvantaged students. Economically disadvantaged students are those receiving Pell funding at any time. During the last five-year period, the number of degrees and certificates awarded to economically disadvantaged students has increased by 3.4%. You can see there's been a little curve, an increase and a dip, but overall 3.4%. I'll pause here for any questions. The big increase we saw in 2018, was that related to our efforts to, we had a number of efforts through student services to get students back if they were within, uh, what was it, three to 12 hours of finishing, we, we had significant efforts. So was, is that the 2018 jump that we see? Or what do you attribute that to? We do attribute the 2018 numbers, which are the largest that the college has ever had, to our partnership with Civitas and identifying individuals who are nearing completion, and there were robust outreach efforts to contact those students. Um, since then, a lot has happened, but um, I do believe we'll get there again. And uh, uh, keep in mind as well, as I mentioned, that if you look at the number of students earning degrees and certificates, that has been consistent if you do not look at the duplicated number of awards. Mm -hmm. Mr. I have Bennett. a question. Yes. Uh, it looks like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like about half of our graduates are economically disadvantaged. Is that about correct? Yes, mm -hmm. about half. And what's the percentage that, of the student body that is economically disadvantaged? I would have to get back to you on that. I think it's a lot, a lot higher than half. So it looks like we're, we're not graduating the same percentage that the student body has. And I'm wondering why that is. I see what you're saying, that it looks like of our graduates, half of them are designated as economically disadvantaged. But if you look at our entire population um, receiving Pell, who are economically disadvantaged, those students may not be graduating at the same rates. A, a smaller percentage. That's mm -hmm. what it appears. Mm -hmm. That is definitely something that I can confirm. And we have not done a lot of studies on that particular population, but there's things that we can attribute just based on on circumstances, additional responsibilities that come that are attributed to being economically disadvantaged that make it harder to complete. But I'm glad you brought that up. I'll look into that to confirm, and then we'll we'll see what additional strategies we may need and, to put and in place. That, that's my concern because that's going to perpetuate the cycle of being economically disadvantaged. Once they get a degree, they're going to get out of that, break the cycle, and that's my concern. That's a very good point. That's what we're here for, to break that cycle. You're right. 
Any additional questions? All right. To tell our Del Mar College story comprehensively, we must, we must also include the number of, of completion certificates issued by our continuing education programs. This slide provides a summary of the completion certificates issued during the past four years for some of our most popular programs, health, safety, and CCER industrial certifications. And additionally, the Rebuild Texas program has provided the opportunity for individuals to gain skills in the construction and building industry. Um, 260 students have completed that program. I will pause here for any questions. Just to comment, mm -hmm. just to comment, this has been the area that, uh, that we have seen, if we're talking about creating the pipeline uh, for experience here at Delmar College and drilling, taking it back into the younger and younger ages, this has been, this has been it um, at the high schools. Um, where things have opened up uh, since HB5, several sessions ago, where there are more options, um, this has been what we've been, th this is how we've been reaping um, or yielding more uh, enrollments through the continuing education side. The students here are going off and doing so many different things, everything from going straight to work, getting that AAS degree and going straight to work and transferring on to medical schools and the like with these certifications behind them, especially the, obviously the healthcare. On the safe, safety side, um, I wanna give uh, thanks and kudos to Lenora Keyes and her team, Dr. Leonard Rivera, Dan, Dean uh, Leonard Rivera and Dean, Dan Corris for really working to, to uh, uh, proliferate this, this, this type of instruction. It's putting skills in students' hands at a young age and helping them wake up about the future and do things and get credentials, uh, real life credentials that can make a big difference um, in their lives immediately. Um, so you see those programs, uh, you know, what does a HAZWOPPER has have to do with phlebotomy? Well, nothing, that's how varied this is. Um, it, it's, it's expanding into those NCCER certifications as well, where the high schools are just eating that up. We're changing the way education is viewed here. And I, I think we still have a long way to go with the school districts, but they're reacting very positively. And it has a lot to do with those buses. I saw the buses from the, from the high schools coming into this campus, taking in this part of the curriculum this morning. And so it's just a, Fantastic area for future growth. Funded growth by the state, I might add. Okay. Are there any questions on KPI 1? I know we looked at KPI 1 from many angles. All right, let's move on to KPI 2, graduation rates. This KPI differs from the first KPI in that it follows a particular cohort of students not all of our students. In this case, we're looking at first time in college students, also known as FTICs, enrolled on a full-time basis. Cohort tracking is an effective way to establish rates, but we do have to keep in mind that it only monitors a very small percentage of our overall student body. So we include this as part of our strategic plan, as part of our KPIs, because the state looks at and monitors this, but it does have quite a bit of limitations due to the small sample size. What is that sample size? Approximately 500 students. So our three-year graduation rate for 2020 tracks full-time FTIC students who first enrolled at DMC in 2017, and that cohort consisted of 500 students. The cohorts for the four-year graduation, four graduation rate and six-year graduation rates were also around 550 students, so very small. This KPI looks at the rate of students who graduated from Del Mar College or any other public Texas institution within the timeframes listed. As you can see, we have met our thresholds for our four-year and our six-year graduation rates. We have also already met our target for 2024 for our six-year graduation rate. We fell short of our threshold for our three-year graduation rate. And on this slide, you'll also see how we compare to our large college peers. Here's a visual representation of our five-year trends. Our thresholds and targets are described on the right-hand side. 
you will see that overall, we have experienced upward trends for the four-year and the six-year rates during the last five years. Our three-year rate has fluctuated during this time period, ranging from 13.5% to 17.8%. And in just a few minutes, we'll be talking about our part-time versus our full-time population. And you'll see that that three-year rate is hard to accomplish because so many of our students are enrolled part-time. So again, we've seen increases, but that three-year rate, we've seen some fluctuations. Here are the details of our graduation rates for Del Mar College, our large college peers, and all Texas colleges for the past five years. What's important to notice on this slide is the rate of change over this time period, as highlighted in yellow in the right-hand column. We are always seeking to improve, and it's helpful to see if we are in improving at a rate that's similar to our peers. Our rate of change for our four-year rate is greater than our large college peers and all of our Texas college peers. Our rate of change for our three-year grad rate and our six-year grad, grad rates lags behind our peers, and we seek to increase the rate at which we are improving them. Are there any questions on KPI 2? Just, just a quick comment, if I may. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anytime you affect and go after the gra the, these uh, graduation rates, retention rates, and so forth, you start from the outside and work your way back in. What's happening is the students that are struggling most are struggling and stretching themselves out, and those are the ones that are just, those are the ones we're gathering their attention with our attention uh, to advising and those kinds of things. This is where those federal grants and all of these other types of programs, everything that we're focused on putting our hands literally and figuratively on, on a student's shoulder to, to bring them in, that, that's the way it works. So those that are out there just stretching themselves, doing, you know, that have the most challenges are the ones that we're able to, to grab first. And, and bring in and work to bring their numbers down. That's what this is showing. That's just the way it is at, at, at colleges, but this is a good, good effort towards that, that goal. We still got a long ways to go, we know that. The commuter nature of this college that has been here for decades is our strength and our weakness in this regard. Any questions on KPI 2? A good KPI to keep in mind, but it definitely has its limitations. All right, we will now discuss KPIs three and four, time and semester credit hours to degree. These KPIs measure the average length of time in years and the average attempted semester credit hours to complete an associate degree. Associate degrees are built, um, if you are on a full-time track, to be completed in two years, and the state mandates that they require 60 credit hours with some exceptions. So on average, you can expect um, a full-time full student with no obstacles may be able to complete in four years. That's the ideal, two years, I mean. Unlike most of the, under, of the other indicators that we're discussing this morning, our goal is to decrease these numbers. In 2020, the college did not meet its threshold for average time to degree but did meet the threshold for average semester credit hours to degree. Here is a visual representation of our average time to degree for the past five years. As you can see, our rates have remained consistent during this time period at around five years. This indicator has been looked at very closely by our Guided Pathway Steering Committee, which is made up of faculty and staff from all over the college, and is one of the main reasons why we decided that we needed to implement Guided Pathways. We do understand that the majority of our students are enrolled on a part-time basis, but we still wanna do all that we can to help them enroll in more courses and to complete their associate's degree within a shorter amount of time. Here's a visual representation of our average semester credit hours to degree for the past five years. We have had an overall decrease in recent years and we have set an ambitious target for 2024. Both of these KPIs have been a main focus of the work of our guided pathways and in just a little while, we'll be talking about our strategies, some of which you've heard about before. GPS, Guided Pathways to Success, which is our efforts to help 
provide um, stronger advice and support to our students. Um, we know that college is, a, is sometimes a time for people to explore, to figure out what they want to do, but we want to give them the tools necessary to help them select the classes that they need so that they can meet their goal, get out the door, and do what they need to do. Question. Question. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand, it, and this goal is a good goal, to try to reduce the time to degree, but we have a population, in my opinion, a high population of students that are working students either have family obligations or their economic background is just such that they just cannot go full time. And for those for those students that are not going full time, it's unrealistic that you're going to be able to improve on their time, reduce their time to degree. And so again, you're comparing Del Mar College, say for instance, to Blinn, where maybe some families are sending students that come from an economic advantage background that can go through college, whether it takes four years, five years, six years, or, or just taking their prerequisite studies for Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. That's a different scenario than, I'm gonna say, students that already have families that have to work and they study just in whatever amount of time they have outside of their work and family responsibilities in order to be able to improve their, their you are absolutely right. We do understand that our students have very significant responsibilities outside of just going to, to school, completely understand. And in just a few minutes, we'll be looking at that percentage of part-time students. So even though we understand that um, it may be difficult to help them become full-time, which by the way, what the full-time status means is student enrolled in 12 credit hours a semester. There are some colleges that have been successful with trying different scheduling models, such as shorter term sessions to allow students to enroll in more, uh, more classes, and I know that's something that we're looking at. So part of the reason why we share this particular indicator, coupled with this other one, the average semester credit hours to degree, is that we know that we may not be able to impact this indicator, the time indicator, very significantly. However, coupled with this indicator, if we're able to help our students be more strategic in their course taking, then down the road, this will allow them to graduate within a shorter amount of time. So I completely agree with you. The time indicator on its own, um, there's not a lot we can do about it, but we're gonna try. Principal James Crenshaw, now Associate Superintendent over at Flower Bluff, tells the best story of his 10 years as a meat cutter while he was here at Del Mar College before he earned his associate degree. 10 years to earn the associate degree, and then he kept going. Um, associate superintendent now over there at the school. Wonderful role model for our students out there. But those are the students you're talking about, and we understand that's the strength. Again, two sides of the coin. How do we balance that, and how do we uh, take on both roles? Because we have to be here for those long haul students, too. Now your, yes. your, your work on the flex programs where they can actually mm -hmm. take I want to say instruction over a shorter period of time that versus a standard semester. Is that yes. geared toward eight week, trying to improve these numbers? Eight-week semesters is a big uh, strategy that we continue to, to proliferate and establish those uh, shorter timelines for those students to complete quicker. Um, Dr. Jonda can talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit uh, as far as our strategies, but those are definitely a part of it's going to be a key part of how we get through the fall. The second eight weeks is what people are waiting for. We knew it. I used the term squishy to describe the first part of our enrollment for um, uh, a fall this semester. I'm going to move it from squishy to mushy uh, after, this, after the, uh, the, the resurgence of the virus uh, that's, that we're still upon, still upon us. So um, stay tuned for that. And Dr. John, I'll ask you to, if you can make note, to talk a little bit about eight week when you get back up on the, to the microphone. That'll, that'll be helpful. Thank you. I do have a question, it may not be for you, Dr. Wilson, but for the team. Uh, given where we are in, in our strategic plan calendar and that we've got a very aspirational goal by 2024 in this particular KPI, what, what are some of the, the leading indicators to tell us whether or not we're going to be on track for that? And, and, and is, there, is there something transformational that needs to happen in this area 
in September of 2021 to help us attain yes. this, uh, this KPI by 24. One of the, if I may, um, and Dr. Jonda, please feel free to jump in because I think we're going to, we've been talking about this. Uh, our, one of the greatest, strongest strategies uh, to, to answer your question, uh, it just kicked off this fall semester in earnest. Uh, we, we've, we've delayed the start of our pathways. Um, I don't want to call it program, but scope of work and how it shaped um, the curriculum. We've already talked about it. Dr. Uh, Christine has already alluded to it and mentioned it a couple of times. That has been one of the greatest areas of bringing in the parameters for students to choose, to choose um, their areas and to begin focusing more so that time to completion will be uh, uh, more affected, effective, so that we're more effective and they are more affecting their, 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 their time to completion. Um, that, uh, in, in addition to the other uh, strategies and advising and so forth, you can begin to see that the, the, the hours are ticking down, um, but it's, it's, it, I think we're still dealing with their, with their lifestyles um, on top of that. But my short answer for right now, I'll have a more complete answer later, I think, is uh, the Pathways Project and the importance of that. It's just kicking off fall 21. We've been waiting two years to kick this thing off and we've delayed it so, until we did it right. And uh, we've got it in place right now uh, for the fall. And we can talk more, to, uh, more uh, in detail to explain what that actually means. And so what will be a leading indicator by the end of this uh, academic year to let us know if we're on track? Uh, is, there, is there a number of students who are enrolled in that program? Is it, is it uh, how, to tell me what the indicators are so, so we know kind of what to keep an eye on. I think going back, I think going back to the completers, um, leading indicators. John, can you, Lenora, do y'all have, have thoughts? I'm, I'm, I'm still stuck on pathways. I, I would say some of the leading indicators that we could look at are credit degree accumulation by semester and by year. There you go. When you go to the trustee institute, that's actually something that they'll be talking about and is relatively new. So what you're uh, talking about, Regent Scott, is a lot of these, we're measuring things that have already happened. Students have already graduated. So when it comes to the leading indicators, we want to look at are our students accumulating credit early on? The first mm -hmm. semester, the first year, the second year. That would be my recommendation to look at. And in regards to meeting this target, part of what you'll see with some of these targets is we have set an ambitious stretch goal. And personally, the way I respond to my team is there may be some things that we don't meet, but we have to continue to strive. As Dr. Escamilla mentioned, we just implemented the pathway structure this fall. We're going full steam ahead with our GPS advising plan. Um, how, even though we believe those strategies are very strong strategies, it takes time to, to implement. So this could be something that we very well continue to measure in our next strategic plan. I think it's that important that it may need to carry over. And I realize that the pandemic and, and all kinds of things have, have impacted our students. But when I think about in 2024, uh, the student who we hope to have completed their degree uh, excuse me, not average time to degree. Let's go, let's go to semester credit hours. There we go. That student started uh, in 2020, maybe even 2019. So they're already here. How are we making it? So th that's what I'm talking about. If, if, if I, I appreciate that we have to look at the big picture, but, but I'm really trying to help us understand how are we in what's the indicators on this group of students who we know who they are and we know that COVID impacted them. So how are we taking that group of, you know, 5,000 freshmen and making sure that they're, <laughs> they're moving through it's, the system efficiently? It's really about analyzing that first 15 to 30 hours mm -hmm. and, 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 and their efficiency there. That's what Dr. Christine is referring to. So it's, it's, it's taking that slice, that cohort, and analyzing their efficiencies on that front end um, in, a, in about a year or two 
um, after about a year or two under their belt. And I, I think we're, we're, there's, there's multiple eyes that are watching me right now that, are, that, that, that can help me uh, take that, that really cross-section. Gracie's nodding back there too. So everybody's, everybody's and, and so, so is Cheryl. Um, so we'll take that one and, uh, and begin doing, or, or continue doing that, that kind of deeper analysis um, is that something for, for you, leader, could, leader you can track indicators. and bring back when we look at this again? I, I'm That's something we may be able to, to begin tracking. Okay. And the word that uh, Dr. Escamilla said that's, that stood out to me was efficiency. We know our students are here, we know they're taking classes, but we want to make sure they're in the right major, that they're not making changes, that they're making the right choice for them. So we've recently implemented, and, you're, and you're, you'll hear in a little while, um, MC Career Coach, and that's going to be embedded within our student orientations, within our first advising appointments, so that they make that choice early on. So some of the things that we can track are students changing their majors, for one. Um, two, when it comes to efficiency, and this one may take a little bit longer for us to track as we're moving to anthology. Part of the reason why we were sold in, in anthology is they have excellent pathways tools to help students see whether or not they are on track. We want to increase their efficiency. We don't want them to enroll in classes that aren't going to apply to their degree plan. And we're able to do that on a limited basis right now with what we have in Colleague. So um, we're really looking forward to Anthology being in place and in particular that Pathways tool so we can monitor their efficiency. Closely related to this is that uh, those previous slides over in CE, when you see those thousands of students, or, or um, let me say, thousands of enrollments that we, that we just showed with the CE units, both in the industrial and the health side, that's waking them up earlier. That's giving them real life opportunities. That's a, that's a lead in to all of this earlier. Again, this goes back, I don't know, I guess three sessions ago now, four sessions ago with HB5. Where, the, mm -hmm. where, where, where prior to that, all the students were really focused on four year and, and nothing else, or, or everything else, shall we say. When they opened it up, and, and when the, when the uh, legislature worked with the school districts to open it up to where the students can have multiple avenues, that really freed us up to, to, to again, get in there, work with them. It's the equivalent of now we're syncing up that, 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 those, the, the various ways a high school student can actually graduate with our own pathways and it correlates with that. It works very closely um, to prepare those students earlier and earlier and earlier so that we do have that efficiency that we're trying to find at and greater I, numbers. I've made a note, Regent Scott, so that the next time we see this again, um, just like with our other indic indicators, we try to show you different angles, um, and I see what you're saying, that this is, this is a lagging indicator. This is already when they've left us. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we can definitely explore when this comes forward again. Mm -hmm. One of the key indicators that we can develop is to begin to look at programs. As you look at individual programs, you'll be seeing programs for students complete quicker, and you'll see, we'll be able to analyze through, through the anthology, we'll be able to analyze the programs where students tend to lag. And so when you begin to look at what makes up an average, that's where you can pull out and really find your, your leading indicators. Because there are programs that are finishing quicker, and there's other programs that are taking longer. Also, some programs require more hours, even though the state uh, in about, I think, 2014 uh, required that we reduce all of our programs down to 60 hours. Prior to that, many of the programs were over 70 hours. And so you, there's been a shift in the data that when you look at an average it makes up that average. And so over the next few years, you'll see a lot of change, and those leaning indicators are out there. I have a question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> These numbers don't include develop developmental hours, do they? They do not. Do most of our students have to take developmental courses? Yes. And what, what happens to the numbers once we add in those developmental courses? That's a very good question. It's something that I would have to um, I'd have to, to seek to analyze myself. This information comes from the state and their own formula. We've tried to replicate it, it's a little bit hard to replicate, but um, given the year, about 60% of our students, 60 to 70% require um, remediation in one or more subject areas. So that would mean that um, it would increase their time. What, what is the maximum number of, 
of developmental hours that they would have to take. I thought it was like 28. Am I incorrect in that? I'll defer to Dr. Halcom on that. Yeah, 27. But the case of the So we're doing co-requisites to cut the time in half. So those are some big strategies right now. Um, so they could take the college level course, same time they're taking the developmental course. They work in synchrony uh, there. And then also we have our um, English INRW taken with the English 1301, which is the college level course. So we're trying to cut those in half, uh, the amount of time. But okay. if a student starts at a very low level, uh, very low reading level, they need to take reading INRW, then they can do the college level as well. And I'm sorry, you had another question. Uh, well, that, it sounds like that could add a, an entire year they could. To a full-time student. They could if they're at the very lowest level um, of like reading or mathematics, at the very low level. Uh, but we have many students that do succeed uh, by taking that co-requisite and they can actually finish within that first semester. But they have to dedicate their time in those developmental courses so that it doesn't um, hold them up to degree completion. Well, I, I'd like to see what the, the numbers do to these, if we add in the, the averages, what it does to, to the numbers that we're presenting here. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is a very good discussion. I know sometimes it takes some, some time, but as I mentioned before, these two indicators were part of what really um, helped us to understand that we needed to implement guided pathways and strengthened advising pathways. Just really Hard quickly, ahead. for the newer regions especially, Dr. Jonda, could, well, let, me, let me jump out there really quickly. A co-requisite model is, is something that the state really mandated uh, that we do for developmental, developmental ed because of the types of things you're talking about, Mr. Bennett. Um, and it's designed to, again, expedite that experience. And then also give students hope, opportunity, and credit in related areas. So they could take a developmental math and an HVAC course, you know, and some other areas that way. So there's an example, HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. So, so they, 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 they could earn, and I, have, I, have, I know people, I know people personally who have done this at the college. While they're earning their developmental work, they get a level one certificate in HVAC, mm -hmm. and they get to go out there and, 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 and contextualize that learning and give them hope, give them opportunities. So it, it does work uh, for those, especially in the technical fields, it's a little tougher on those that want to go off and transfer because it, you know, they've, they've got to uh, get out of that developmental work to take an English class, to take that history class and so forth. It, it's, a, it's a, again, another, it's another two-sided blade, but uh, it's one that came from the state, so just FYI there. Uh, just a quick comment on that as well. And it'll be interesting to continue to monitor this as the state is using a new assessment instrument. So it'll be interesting as well. You talk about uh, in K-12, the end of course exams that they take and how that also ties with that instrument. Very interesting point. Okay, to wrap up the discussion on KPIs three and four, let's talk about the details that you see on your screen. Here you'll see the last five years of, years of data for Del Mar College, our large college peers, and all Texas colleges. Again, here in yellow is our rate of change over this time period. 
Through our guided pathways work and strengthened advising structures, we seek to reduce our numbers at a faster pace. Okay, I've referenced this a few times this morning, very interesting stuff, KPI 5, full-time and part-time enrollment comparison. We are seeking to increase the percentage of our students who are enrolled on a full-time basis and decrease the percentage of students who are enrolled part-time. And as uh, Regent Garza mentioned, that is a, a difficult thing to accomplish, but we think in the, in the long run, it'll help our students if we can provide them with some different scheduling opportunities or encourage them to take additional classes. It's important to note that the average age of our credit students is 24 years old. And as we've discussed, most of our students have significant responsibilities outside of the classroom, including employment and parenthood. And though it may not be possible to increase this su uh, substantially, we're gonna try. As you can see from this snapshot, we did not meet our thresholds for fall 2020. Here is a visual representation of students' enrollment status over time, and you will see the change that occurred just this past fall. There was a drastic change in the percentage of students enrolled full-time, dropping from 27.3% to 19%. We can attribute this change to the impact of COVID-19 on students' lives, workload, responsibilities, and also just um, uncertainty, which was interesting in the survey we gave of students, just the uncertainty of the COVID environment made them hesitant to enroll in many classes. Any questions or comments about this slide? Big change just this past year. This slide uses statewide data to compare student enrollment statuses. This data does include dual credit students. What I'd like to point out is the similarity between Del Mar College's data and the average of all Texas colleges. Our students' enrollment status is much more similar to that of the state average than our large college peers, which could explain some of the differences in our other KPIs. Are there any questions or comments about full-time and part-time status? Okay, moving on to KPI 6, transfer to a four-year institution. This indicator looks at the transfer rate of first-time in college students. So again, just a small subset of our population. And this rate looks at FTICs over a six-year period. To get our 2020 transfer rate, the state tracks the 2014 FTIC cohort, and this cohort consisted of just over 1,300 students with both full-time and part-time statuses. In 2020, we did meet our threshold. It's important to note that in addition to the 14.2% of the cohort that transferred, an additional 14.3% completed a certificate or degree but did not transfer. The state calls these students non-transfer completers. Not all of our students will seek to transfer, as we've discussed um, quite a few times. In the fall of 2020, 46% of our credit students had a declared workforce program major, which are not intended to transfer. So about half of our student body on the credit side seeks a workforce credential. That's important to keep in mind when looking at this indicator. Here's a visual, visual representation of our transfer rate trends. Over the past five years, our rate of transfer has increased overall, and we are aiming for a 17% transfer rate by 2024. Here are the transfer rate details for Del Mar College, our large college peers, and all Texas colleges. Overall, our transfer rate has increased though we seek to accelerate the rate of our improvement. Another way to understand transfer, as Dr. Escamilla alluded to at the beginning of this morning, is to look at the number of all students, not just the cohorts of all students that transfer each year. This slide includes our most recent data. Of the students enrolled in the 2018-2019 academic year, 
over 1,900 transferred to a four-year institution by the following fall. 262 students transferred to another community college, and 212 Del Mar College graduates re-enrolled at Del Mar College. Of the uh, 1,979 students who transferred, over 1,500 of them were enrolled at transfer degrees, were enrolled in transfer degrees at Del Mar College and transferred before graduating, 1,500. This demonstrates that not every student seeks to earn a degree from us, but instead they choose to start their college careers here and then transfer when they're ready. Our top transfer institutions are also included on this slide. I'll pause here for any questions. This is that other half of that story that I was talking about. I know you mentioned it. I don't. There's again another 15 to 1800 on top of this on a given year. Let's just call it 1500 to be conservative. Another 1500 leavers that are going off and doing just fine. Marcus Camille was one. I didn't graduate from Del Mar College till 2010, till I became president. So I, I lacked that last class, that, that, that three-hour class. So many of so many people. Um, are, are, are using it for the, for, for the uh, kind of a launching point. It's the other half of that story. So, um, and those are goal setters. Those are, those are people who are attaining their goals and going off to the same universities that we see up there. So about 1,000 students, about 900 students or so go to A&M Corpus Christi, about 250 or so go to, to Del Mar, uh, excuse me, to A&M Kingsville. Yep, 900 or so, 850, 900 at Corpus Christi, 250 to 300 at Kingsville, and then UTSA, UT A&M and the like. Mm -hmm. It's a significant, it's a significant deal, and, and uh, tracking those other levers is really, really tough. Um, you have to go to state databases for that, but uh, they do transfer. But we it's do worth have, it. It's yes. working. And that's, that's why we, we look at 2018, 2019 data. We have to do this analysis ourselves. Um, takes a little longer to get this data. And you can see as well that the number of students transferring are increasing every year. Any questions or comments on this KPI? All right, we're getting to the end of our data discussion. Our final KPIs for goal one are focused on dual credit success. These are new indicators which we have recently begun tracking. We are not required by the state to collect data on dual credit success, but I believe that this, that this is a significant part of the Del Mar College story that we need to tell. We have always looked at our dual credit enrollment data and now we seek to focus on ensuring their success. Our first step was to identify dual credit seniors for the most recent academic years you can see the number of enrolled dual credit seniors in the left-hand column. From there, we sought to determine how many of those seniors earned a credit degree or certificate by the time that they completed high school. We also wanted to know how many seniors chose to enroll at Del Mar College after completing high school. Finally, we wanted to know how many more of these seniors earned a credit degree or certificate from Del Mar College within one year of completing high school. As you can see, these numbers are very positive. And at this time, we do not have thresholds or targets for these indicators as we are just beginning to understand them. And we don't have access to information for the remainder of the students in each cohort to know if they went on to a four-year degree to another community college, I mean, four-year institution to another community college this is only tracking what they did at Del Mar. This particular slide only tracks what they do at Del Mar. Mm -hmm. That's another layer of analysis that we are going to seek to complete, but this next slide will answer part of that story. So we looked at particular cohorts on this slide. Now let's look just at transfers. Of the dual credit students enrolled in the 2018-2019 academic year, 710 transferred to a four-year institution by the following fall. 79 students transferred to another community college and 23 dual credit dual enrollment graduates re-enrolled at Del Mar College. 
One thing that's really important to note is that dual credit students are not counted as FTICs until after they graduate from high school. Therefore, the 710 students who transferred are not included as part of our graduation rates. So we talk about telling our story and knowing the context. That's why we share all this data with you that all of these pieces together tell the overall story. Does the state and federal guidelines that they restrict us on that? I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, now, you, I know you all have early college high school agreements, like you have your, your early college high school here at Del Mar, and you have some other uh, early college high school agreements or MOUs with some of our schools, correct? And then you have MOUs or agreements for career pathways, maybe a, a certain program. Yes. Uh, for example, and I don't know if I, I would just use what I'm familiar with, the 42 school districts in Region 2, how many of our school districts, and I don't know if you know this, but how many of, your, of our school districts actually have some type of either MOU or program or early college high school? And, and are, is, that a, is that something that would be uh, a goal to, uh, to increase, or is that not something that would be a goal? Dr. John, do you, and I know Gracie, you're pinging back there too. Do you have a number off the top of your head? I know there's lots of them. Uh, come on, come on up. But it sounds like you're talking about early college high schools, but overall, all of our agreements. Sure, and, and that's what I'm saying. Not Yes, we do, and, and since they, with the House Bill 5 and starting in the, in the ninth grade, a lot of them have turned into an early college, early high school, so they've started real early in, in the ninth grade in the various programs. Uh, we have uh, West Oso right now and Robstown that are an early college on top of the Collegiate High School and Harold branch that we do, but really all of them have started dual credit and a lot of their various programs um, very early on. And those, and those MOUs are numerous. I mean, yes. we, we, we've signed one, Ooh, I think. About, they, oh, about 47. About, yes, yeah. I was gonna say. Seven of them. Yeah. I was gonna say 30. I just know I sign them all the time and <laughs> go through them and it's just year after year. Every one of those <laughs> has to be a signed MOU, a signed understatement, a uh, signed statement rather, of an understanding between both institutions as to what is actually offered. So it could be a sliver of a program, a single program, it could be 10 programs and just shy of a full collegiate high school type of experience. Some are closer than others, but uh, both in and out of district, we have them, er and every year we renew those MOUs. And I would just ask that uh, <laughs> consideration be taken into those articulation agreements with the, at least the universities near us, that mm -hmm. our kids, many of them would go to a and Corpus Christi or Kingsville, so that those hours count and, and that it's able to, they're able to carry something over into the Yes, we look at transferability yes. at the various institutions. Yes, we do. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Okay, our final data slide. Let's take a look at continuing education certifications earned annually. During the 2020-2021 academic year, 863 certifications were earned from the phlebotomy technician, electrocardiography technician, patient care technician, and basic medical assistant programs. And as you can see, that number has increased significantly due to new partnerships and additional classes offered at our partner institutions. I will pause for any questions on this KPI or any, any questions on any of the KPIs discussed this morning. I would like to say that I know um, the review of this data is, is time consuming for, for you, but I hope that it gives you a picture of what we're doing, where we're strong, and where we need to improve, and your comments and your recommendations help guide our efforts within our committee, so I, I very much appreciate that. Last month, I provided an update on our SAC COC reaffirmation activities, and I talked about our quality enhancement plan. 
otherwise known as a QEP. This QEP has been branded as GPS, Goals Plus Planning Equals Success, and it incorporates a lot of these strategies we've already touched on this morning to help students find their pathway early and to get the help that they need to either earn a degree or certificate from us or to transfer or to enter into the workforce. This plan includes five goals. In addition, we also um, were very successful, very, very happy that we also got the Title V grant, Project Senda, which helps us to fuel some of these efforts. So we're gonna take a few minutes to discuss some of the strategies associated with these goals. And I'll ask my colleague, Dr. John DeHalcom, to get us started with a talk about guided pathways. As mentioned, the college has developed a uh, QEP called GPS Goals Plus Planning Equals Success and guided path pathways that will help in achieving goal one of the strategic plan. Along with the QEP, we have our guided pathways, as I said. That includes these eight GPS map areas that you see in the slide. The areas are arranged within our four academic divisions. We just recently started two new academic divisions taking the place of arts and sciences to better align with the pathways for success. So we now have a communications, fine arts, and social science, or we call it CFAS division, and a science, technology, engineering, math, kinesiology, education, or STEM KE division as well. So the eight major areas are within those for in four academic divisions. The structure has served as the foundation for the college's quality enhancement plan, which as mentioned is focused on improving student advising. Guided pathways will provide students a clear roadmap to one time on time completion. The basic features of guided pathways are clarify paths to students' end goals, help students choose and enter a pathway, help students stay on path, and ensure students are learning. Guided pathways and our QEP go hand in hand in improving success of the college to meet the goal of achieving student success and completion. You can see here in a screen something that we have recently done, or at least the GPS team has done, They've redesigned areas of the website and reorganized our pathways. And if you can see before, um, if you're a student, it's kind of hard to figure out where you should go, right? And so you see the after, we have our eight pathways. Students can clearly see those, they can navigate. And there's a link to what Christina had mentioned earlier to career coach. And I'm gonna talk about that in the next slide. So um, the college purchased a contract with EMSI to utilize career coach software tool. It provides a comprehensive labor market data to help students find careers that match their strengths and discover programs at Del Mar College that will prepare them for success. This software includes a career assessment that allows prospective and current students to once again identify their career interests and strengths. The results of the assessment are linked directly to the college's guided pathway structure and our college online catalog as well. Career Coach also will provide students with local job market data, as you can see here um, on accountants. Uh, you can see some of that data that they do produce. So we think Career Coach will help students to make informed decisions. Now I can tell you this weekend, I thought I'd try Career Coach and see, will it come up with the STEM area, because that's been my area. Yes, it did, 100% <laughs> STEM. So I, it worked. So but glad I you think, chose the right career. <laughs> well, I don't know. It said, um, you know, I went into biology, but it kept taking me to electrical engineering. And it's interesting, when I was in high school, I took an assessment it went to electrical engineering. So I don't know, maybe I missed my calling. I don't know. But anyway, it's fun to take and I encourage you to go to that website and explore. It's very easy to find. 
it's at delmar.edu forward slash degrees. So it's just kind of fun. See if you're in the right career, right? And what do you do about it now? Do Dr. Janda, I know a lot of research entomologists that hang out with electrical engineers. It's all the uh, same. Absolutely. I, I never told you that, but yeah, hang out with them. Are our, <laughs> sure. stu are our students required to use career coach? Uh, assessment prior to advising? Are they just encouraged to? Uh, we what have our... not required it yet. Um, that's part of our advising plan, though, to require that. And so we're going through many training sessions so that faculty are aware of it and that they will use it and encourage students to use it. Um, and then I think in, like, Gracie's area with the liberal arts advisors, they take them through career coach as well. Now, um, it's very interesting, so I encourage you, like I said, to try it out. Try Career Coach out, see what happens. We're very fortunate, as Christina had mentioned, to have the Send a Title V HSI grant to assist in providing advising professional development for our faculty and staff. The Project Send a Grant is playing a major part in our completion strategies. Advising, of course, is the key uh, component in reaching the completion goal. Currently, our advising model consists of embedded advisors, staff advisors, and faculty. And uh, advising is one of the fundamental responsibilities of all uh, full-time faculty at the college. So Project Senda has designed comprehensive advising training to um, help out and to enhance advising um, opportunities for our students and for our faculty to be trained. To date, we have about 71 graduates of the Level 1 Advising Certification course and uh, 22 uh, for the Level 2, and they're, work they're doing a session right now for, I believe, Level 1. And so we do have people, we've tried to encourage our new faculty to take those certification courses so they do start out right in the knowledge of advising. And we are fortunate to have a director of advising initiatives that coordinates multiple advising opportunities throughout the year for our faculty and staff. She also identifies the tools and resources available uh, to our faculty and our staff to enhance advising, such as how to use Civitas, career coach, et cetera. Now, this grant is going to increase the number of embedded advisors by four. We currently have eight embedded advisors. Several of the STEM advisors that we have were initially funded through a different Title V uh, STEM grant a few years ago, and we institutionalized those, and they've made great progress. And so we know that it is a good situation to have our embedded advisors. By the end of the SENDA grant, we'll have a total of 12 embedded advisors. In other words, what I mean by embedded is that they reside within the departments where the students are, and that's what makes it successful, where the faculty and the students reside. Um, the embedded advisors complement five liberal arts advisors and over 300 faculty advisors that serve our students. So um, this increase of advisors, advisors plus the purposeful training will result in better advising sessions and lead to our student success. Now before I hand this over to Dean Sanders, um, I was asked to address the eight-week sessions and I want to mention that our new Oso Creek campus, we intend to go fully eight-week with some exception, you know, some courses that require too many hours even within a 16-week it would be hard to compress them into eight weeks. So those should be minimal exceptions. I think this is a great opportunity if we have the campus solely eight week to see the success for our students that take the eight week in our cornerstone programs especially. Right now, when we've looked at data for the eight week and 16 week and we try to compare, it's a little hard because some of our students are taking 16 week and eight week and they're not solely eight-week or 16-week students. But we still have shown success with eight-week where there's a greater level of um, retention, perhaps, in those classes or a greater GPA. Um, but it's still really hard to determine. And I think with the um, Oso Creek campus, I think we're really going to use that data 
and really see success. We know other colleges have seen great success with eight-week courses. So, and we do intend to increase eight-week courses for our spring semester as well. And as Dr. Escamilla indicated, um, we are trying to increase some for this fall as well. Because with COVID and those situations, some of the students may be hesitant in enrolling right now, and they may join the second eight weeks. So I think we have this wonderful opportunity in front of us with our um, Oso Creek campus. Dr. Escamilla, did you want to say something? Y yes, ma'am. Again, it's a strategy that we had in place. We didn't realize it was going to be mm, as necessary uh, to increase. Last fall, we had the most eight-week sessions, sections, in other words, individual unique classes than, we, that we, than we've ever had. Am I mistaken there? Last fall? I believe we did. I don't have the exact it's data, so I don't want to say without. Yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah. not exact science and stuff, but it was, it was we, we were on our way to more than we've ever had. Um, and now uh, it, as a, as, a, as a strategy, became from strategy to strategy to get through um, the, 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 the resurgence and the spike of the Delta variant. That has a lot to do with our strategies. It had a lot to do with this, this agenda some items that we had to push on to, to next month uh, to discuss with y'all because, because we're adapting to the changes uh, of the spike. What we're understanding, these are important things, um, what we're understanding is that we're, 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 what we understand is we're coming out of a spike. I'm not saying we're out, we're coming out of the spike. Um, there's another, um, well anyway, uh, we're coming out of that spike and that we're, what we believe is that the students will, be, will, will begin to feel that, see that, and react to that and again prepare for that second half of the semester just as they did last fall. Mm -hmm. Remember they loaded up on fall semester late on that second eight weeks so we're getting ready for that and I just had to make that tie in with, with, uh, with the Delta variant unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 again it surprised us all. Yeah absolutely it was and I think it's a good strategy right now absolutely. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask Dean Cheryl Sanders. To, oh, I'm sorry, she's associate VP. I apologize, Cheryl, for that slip up. Um, but I'll ask Cheryl Sanders to expand on the advising and the map advisors. Cheryl. Good morning, Madam Chair and Regents. Right. Goal three, improve student engagement. We will be, I will be discussing advising holds and the new MAP advisor positions that Dr. Halcom brought up. Advising holds, the students are required to meet with an advisor prior to registration until they've achieved 30 credit hours. And there are multiple reasons why we want them to do this. We have a lot of things that we will discuss with them, such as their, um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me start over. We want them to establish a connection with their advisor, be that their MAP advisor, their faculty advisor, or their embedded advisor. We also want to discuss and understand the program of study with them that they're pursuing, and we want to assist the students with the enrollment process. Lastly, we want to explain the university transfer options that are available to them. Additionally, the QEP committee has made the recommendation to increase the advising holds on all students to 45 hours. The rationale behind this is to continue to provide intentional and strategic advising to ensure that students don't go over um, with their degree plan and take courses that are not transferable. Through Project Cinda, MAP advisors have been hired. We've hired four additional ones that are embedded in various departments. We have one that's been hired in communications, fine arts, social sciences, which is called CFAS. We have one that's been hired in kinesiology and education, one that's been hired in nursing and industry, and public safety. We have achieved our goal in hiring talented advisors to support the work of instruction. The addition of the MAP advisors embedded in the academic departments has been well received by the students, faculty, and staff. Any questions about improving student engagement? I do. So are you saying that our goal is to reach one bedded st staff advisor per pathway? Have we reached that goal? How far away are we from that goal? 
So we have reached the goal within Project Cinda, but have we reached the goal campus-wide? Yes, we've reached the goal campus-wide. And if there was, is there a need for more embedded or more focused advisors uh, to reach out? Because we know we've got this swath of students who are struggling in the last couple of years uh, with part-time enrollment, with COVID, with when do they come back? We hear about semester credit hours to degree. Could you use more resources? Are there, are, is there a need to have additional focused advisors? I'll go ahead and speak to that. I do personally believe so because some of our pathways have more um, departments and students enrolled in them, like the CFAS, um, which is our Communications, Fine Arts, and Social Sciences, has quite a large group, and there's one embedded advisor. So I do see that we do need to grow and provide more of those resources to help the students in all of those uh, programs. So I think this, this coaching to, to help students be more efficient in their time, to make sure they're coming back to understand the resources, both life resources and academic resources that are available. I just see that there, it, it's more than about what courses you take. It is about are, you, are, are we helping students move through the, the process more efficiently? And so it's, it's a resource question, and do we have, could we invest uh, and would, there, would that be a wise investment in more, more focused advisors? I personally think, think so, and we're looking at more of the holistic advice, and I think that's what you're referring to, yes. is the holistic approach, and I see where our embedded advisors provide more of that to our students. Faculty have a fundamental responsibility to do advising, but they're also teaching at the same time. Right. We don't want to take away from our faculty advising, however, because they are the specialist also within their discipline. But I think the embedded advisor um, absolutely assists and helps those faculty as well and those students. So you have to, it's synergistic, the faculty with the embedded advisor. Um, yeah. I just wanted to add that in. I'm absolutely yeah. not saying take away anyone yeah. who's doing advising work. I want to mm -hmm. add resources, yes, absolutely. not take away any resources. <laughs> What's the total number of embedded advisors then? It's got to be close to 10. Our goal is 12. Um, have we reached 12? It's, yeah. it's, 10 or, it's 10 or 12. I mean, yeah, we, it's 10 or 12. Yeah, we, we have one that had left. We haven't replaced them. So we have, a, there's a little bit of uh, so flux there. 12, 12 positions so far total outside the new ones. So, so understood though. Because I, I really, I, I, the, the, for me, this whole conversation is about how are we bringing our students back how are we making sure that they are successful when they're here because of, again, all that has gone on academically and otherwise, and then how are we helping them move through as efficiently as, po as their life permits to move on to their educational and career goals. And so we have a unique opportunity in this period of time with some, some uh, CARES Act, with her funding and others, that if, there are, if there's a way that we can focus some of those efforts as a board, I think we want to see those kinds of opportunities uh, because we don't want to bank this money. We want to use this money to help our students because this is it, it affects everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Can we bring students back and can we help them move through efficiently? Do they need academic tutors? Do they need academic mm -hmm. advising? Do they need life coach advising? Where can we use those resources? And that's, that's a question for us as a board is how do we help focus those resources? Uh, and, and is there an opportunity there? So that, that's why I'm asking this level of questions mm -hmm. is, is about helping those students come back and be successful. And we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Regent Avert? I'm sort of scared to turn this on. But, it's um, on. <laughs> no, and I don't have a question, just a, a statement, and I appreciate you bringing that up, that up, Madam Chair, because any of us who have in our lives any college-age students um, I think can describe the um, stress seems like so mild of a word that people have been through in the last 18 months. I mean, we all have, right? We all have our COVID stories, but having, you know, two 20-somethings in my life um, and just seeing the um, mental challenges that they've had to go through um, and one in particular who has looked to her institution for some sort of support 
beyond what typically she has needed in her educational path. So I appreciate everything that our institution is doing to try to be there for the students in a different way than you may have had to two or three years ago. Um, and anything that we can do as a board to support you in that, I would be all for. So thank you all. Wonderful. One other point. We mentioned a number that I don't think we should simply address and move on, and that number is 24. That's the average age of our student anymore. Okay, that number's gone down, I think, four years over the past 10 uh, or so. And so, yes, that means we're, we're ramping up on the younger ones and so forth. Of course, they're coming in as a younger population and so forth. So it, it, it is just a, it is a, an average number. But the average number 20 years ago when I was in graduate school across the nation was closer to 30 plus for the typical community college student. 30 plus, 28, 29, 30, 31, depending on what state, but it's, it's around a 30. And when I got, I, I remember when I arrived here, it was about 26, 27, 28, that number's coming down. Okay, what does that mean? Our resources have got to reflect our, with our strategies um, those students coming in. Um, the students are still here that are 28, 29, 30, 31 years old. They're still here. Um, and the strategies for them um, have also got to be um, different. Those are the tougher, mm, well, those have been out longer and, and all those things that we know about. So, so I just, just want to say that number 24, I don't want to say it surprises me, but when I heard it, when I heard it in a, few, a few months back, a few weeks, months back, I said, whoa, that number was just 26 the other day. So we've got to be ready. And so I, I just want to add that. I appreciate that. And, I, I, and that's obviously dual credit. There's a number of things that, that impact that. But I really think of our students in buckets. We have a, a mm -hmm. big bucket of dual credit students. What, ad, mm -hmm. what advising, what help do they need in addition to what their, college, their high school counselors are doing? What help do they need to transition here or into higher education? What do our traditional freshmen need? What do our non-traditional yes. yes. freshmen need? What do our long time, yep. long haul community college students need to get them over the hump? We've James heard of long haul Crenshaw. COVID, we have long haul community college we'll students. James Crenshaw's. Yep. Exactly, so, so I think of our students in these big buckets yep. and, and it, it's not a one size fits all. Yep. Community college has never been a one size fits all. So that's where, I, that's where I'm coming with all this. No, and, that's, yeah. and I think I, I was trying to say the same thing, I think yeah. uh, differently, um, but, but, but again, it's, it's, things are changing quickly. And the size of the buckets are going to are, are are growing and shrinking and so forth, relatively speaking. But absolutely, um, our, our our division of labor has got to address that as we put our resources behind these strategies for the different ages, different buckets. Absolutely. I'm sorry, Dean Sanders. I didn't mean to hijack your your presentation. No problem. <laughs> oh, that's good. Any further comments? And goal four, strengthen transfer pathways. I'll be discussing transfer maps and articulation agreements, advising checklists, and participation in activities at the state level. DMC has strengthened transfer pathway, pathways by faculty, staff, chairs, and deans continually working on articulation agreements with our neighboring institutions. This is so students can seamlessly transfer to university without losing many credits and reduce time to completion. We have TAMU CC visit the college to work with students on a regular basis, and soon TAMU K will be on our campus. Our faculty works with the coordinating board through committee assignments such as transfer and TSI college readiness. Additionally, at the state level, there's a lot of transfer work occurring, and thankfully DMC is at the table participating in all of these conversations. Gracie Martinez, our Dean of Outreach and Enrollment Services, serves as the Texas Transfer Advisory Committee member. The advising checklist provides a listing of topics for advisors to address with students. There are many, times to there are many items to discuss in these advising sessions. For example, explanation of degree versus certificate, free support services, financial aid, and payment deadlines. And these topics are pertinent to ensuring that the student is well informed in navigating the college. A project CINDA objective is to increase articulation agreements with four-year institutions. This strategy is incorporated into the advising checklist where students will be asked early on in their college career if they plan to transfer 
and encourage the students to research the intended institution. Currently, we have 13 articulation agreements. In addition to our regional partners, TAMU CC and TAMU K, we have agreements with Lamar University, Midwestern State, Purdue University Global, Stark College and Seminary, Texas Tech, Texas Tech Health Science Center, Texas Tech Health Sciences Center, El Paso, University of Phoenix, UT Medical Branch, UT Tyler, and Western Governors University, Texas. Additionally, the DMC GPS Committee is working on a transfer web page to assist students and staff regarding program-specific information on transfer. Any comments on strengthening transfer pathways? Goal five, utilize innovative technology. I'll be discussing anthology and civitas learning. Anthology, the new ERP, is currently in the data migration stage. We look forward to working with the anthology team to deliver to students a robust, intuitive system that can guide them with a degree tool so that they can visually see how far along they are in their academic journey. The degree audit feature will also be cross-referenced with financial aid so that students do not sign up for classes that, that, that are not on their degree plan or that they may have already taken. Civitas campaigns are ongoing and great tools in outreaching to students. Many of the faculty and advisors continue to use this tool to communicate with students so that they stay connected to their program of study. Do you have any questions about utilizing innovative technology? All right, well that concludes my portion and I will turn this back over to Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. One final strategy that I'll be sharing is the use of the SESI survey, which stands for the Community College Survey of Student Engagement. Del Mar College administers this survey every other year, and just this spring we administered it online. It is a lengthy survey that looks in particular at student perceptions of how well they are engaging with the college. And what you see on the screen are just a few questions that we've pulled out and that we monitor to assess how we're doing in regards to advising. So just a few highlights. How much, of, how much has your experience at this college contributed to your knowledge, skills, and personal development in developing clear career goals? 71% of our students said quite a bit or very much. Satisfaction with academic planning advising services, 63% said very satisfied. Both of those um, indicators are well above the state average response. Does your college provide the support you need to help you succeed? 78% quite a bit and very much. How often have you used academic advising planning services during the academic year? 43% said never and one time. This is something that we wish to decrease. We want our students to see us more often. And finally, how often have you used transfer advising planning services during the academic year? 70% said never. And believe it or not, this is in line with the state average, that students do not identify they're getting transfer services. So many of you are aware, and you'll probably hear about at this institute that you'll be at, that the state is really focusing on transfer. Our students need to have those transfer resources, not at the end of their careers, but, but early on. So this percentage reflects overall that as a college, we want to improve. And I know across the state, there's efforts to improve as well. So these are indicators that we will be monitoring every other year. Are there any questions about our strategies? There's a lot going on, lots of important work. Okay, this brings us to the conclusion of our presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning of the morning, the college has an operational plan, which is a living document, and we seek to make adjustments to it as needed based on changing circumstances. So at this point in time, we have version two of our operational plan, and we will seek to have our version three at the end of this year in alignment with our college's annual assessment cycle. So every unit, 
um, every instructional unit, every administrative unit needs to assess how they did this past year. And those results will help us to influence whether some strategies need to be added, whether some need to be prioritized. And in some cases, you'll, you saw some of our KPIs were successfully meeting our targets. Maybe we need to increase them or maybe adjust somewhat. So this will be adjusted later this year. Here is a visual representation of our planning process. It does not have an end. We are continuously seeking to improve. This current strategic plan will be in place through August of 2024, and it will be assessed annually. Today, we focused on goal one. I would venture to say it's all these goals are important, but goal one happens to be one of my favorites. I think the impact is just so far reaching. And throughout the course of the, re the remainder of this academic year, there will be other workshops focusing on the remainder of the goals. I would like to thank you for your time this morning. As I mentioned already, um, the questions that you ask help us to be more, more critical and to think about what we need to do more to support our students. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you've made this a priority to hear about every few months. I'm grateful to Dr. Escamilla, the entire executive team, our deans, our faculty and staff for making this a priority. And I can tell you that our strategic plan and our KPIs are discussed on a regular basis within our committees. And we seek critically, uh, we, we seek to have critical conversations about how we can make improvements. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Escamilla, and your team. Uh, excellent presentation today. Are there any other questions or comments? We will uh, take a recess uh, prior to uh, our convening our regular meeting at 1 p.m. Uh, so with no closed session items for this session, this, meeting, this workshop is adjourned at 12, 13 p.m.